Welcome, everyone. And I will uh, introduce Magda by saying she is a fantastic pianist that I uh, heard for the first time live 10 years ago, and I will never forget it. It's um, She is a pianist and composer and performs uh, internationally, has produced radio works and more than 30 CDs. And on top of this, she also graduated um, recently from the Swedish Kunstnerly Doctorant, the Swedish Artist Research four-year PhD uh, program with a thesis called Orchestration Tambra. And uh, Magda, you probably will uh, continue introducing yourself. So here we go, Magda. Thanks a lot. Yeah, very happy to be here um, and to talk about my work. I will... Um, Start by sharing my screen. And yeah, as you said already, this is the title of my artistic research, which I will mainly talk about today. Um, orchestrating timbre, unfolding processes of timbre and memory in improvisational piano performance. A um, few words about me. As uh, Jakob already said, I'm a pianist, a musician in the realm of improvisation mainly. And I use preparations and objects inside the piano. Um, I started doing that about 20 years ago, simply because I was fascinated with the piano as an instrument and the whole possibilities that you find when you also reach inside it. And um, it's, it's there anyway, you see the strings and everything. And yeah, just to experiment and explore and, and um, to create more possibilities sonically and performatively. Um, and I guess this is also where my interest in timbre and sound uh, stems from. And so, yeah, I would describe myself as a performer mainly, as a researcher and also as a teacher. I teach at the Luzern University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Switzerland. Research catalog exhibition is basically also my, um, yeah, my thesis or accompanying my thesis. Um, but it's also um, now will serve as an introduction to yeah, my work or what I do. So that uh, if you haven't heard me play, you um, get an idea of, of what I do. So in the very first page, and I'm going to scroll down, um, you see a few videos of inside piano techniques that I recorded. And um, these are just demonstrations. I've kind of placed them all over the, the instrument where they happen or where I produce these techniques. They are short videos. If you click on them, and I'm going to encourage you to do that yourself so that the sound is better and you hear, uh, hear it through your devices. Okay, maybe this is just to give you a short uh, introduction. And as I said, they are just um, demonstrations. So you know what I'm talking about when I say preparations and inside piano techniques. I will later um, show you also a part of a performance that you can then click on. Um, but before um, 
talking about the actual projects uh, in my um, artistic research, I wanted to kind of give you an idea of the setting. So um, as the title already implies, it's about improvised music and unfolding improvisational um, processes. So, oops, where did it go? So first of all, I want to talk about uh, improvisation as an investigating of site-specific responses. And in my case, of course, sonic responses, but also bodily and uh, material responses to an environment. So I've just listed a few um, points that I think are important um, or to, to kind of tell you how, how I experience improvisation. And that's an imminent and continuous response to multiple aspects of the environment I find myself in and a way to negotiate within it. I see it as an ethical engagement as well, um, because uh, I have to make decisions about the changing environment and space, about the changing instruments and audience and my collaborators. And uh, yeah, therein also lies in this decision making lies a responsibility and uh, it's an act of engaging and of listening. So what brought me to start this research, I guess, was a curiosity to kind of articulate, but also to expand the possibilities that uh, I find myself in when I improvise. And to also embrace bodily, spatial and material aspects of sound. Because I felt that I hadn't really done that or pinpointed these aspects um, in my performance or maybe more subconsciously. Um, and so that's also a way of understanding the decision-making process, process in an improvised music performance. And that I describe as a continuous remembering and listening to what has been played and to create a response to it. And this remembering, I will also talk about in a bit, uh, how memory plays an important role in my research and in, in improvisational practices as such, I think. The second important thing, which is also in the main title is timbre. And of course you would have heard that, um, you're musicians, you, you deal with timbre all the time. Every kind of music deals with timbre, but it's kind of a very difficult thing to define or nail down. And so um, the interesting thing is that it describes sound as a whole. It's a perceptual phenomenon. It's also one that kind of unfolds over time. And there have been many attempts to define timbre. I'm going to list a few of them. And um, just to let you know, I wasn't trying to quantify it in my research, but rather to find other ways of unfolding the process or to extending that um, term. So one thing that, uh, one way of how timbre is described is by saying what it is not, to describe it as the color of a sound, to talk about how sound is produced rather than talking about the sonic outcome. For example, um, uh, plucking techniques of a string instrument. So all the different kinds of uh, ways how you can pluck a string rather than saying how um, it should sound, or by comparing it to language, or just in a acoustic kind of setting to talk about the frequency balance between different parts of the spectrum. And for me, uh, this kind of balance, so the frequency and intensity experienced over time and also through space meant that I wanted to explore that deeper, what, what all that implies in an improvisational setting. Um, and so during my research, I came to uh, kind of call it an extended understanding of timbre from my perspective as a performer, which would also embrace material, space and body. And so with material, I mean, everything that I deal with to produce the sound. It can be the piano, it can be the objects that I use, it can be the speakers that I use, the microphones. And I um, started uh, to talk about object timbre, action timbre, that refers to playing techniques, and also gesture timbre um, as interactive agents in sound making processes. I'll get to these different terms um, later on. Um, you can, by the way, I'm gonna be checking the chat. Uh, all the time. So if you want to interrupt me and ask a question, um, that's also, um, you should do that, please. Um, these agents I describe as non-hierarchical, inseparable, and in constant flux. 
mainly because I'm dealing with improvisation. So there's uh, the constant need of um, negotiating how the material relates to the space, relates to my body and to find a response for it. And that's what I call the orchestrating of timbre. So really sculpting and transitioning timbre on micro and macro levels. So micro level would be from one sound to the next and the macro level in a whole compositional structure of a piece. Um, I, I always say improvisation slash composition because the, the borders are really fluid and um, because these approaches also overlap. Um, should I answer these questions now, uh, Jakob? Or should we wait you a little? Do you, have you, you, you decide. Okay. Uh, choosing materials to put in the piano. Which reflections did you have of their conceptual, cultural, historical background, each material? Yeah, this is an interesting question because a lot of those um, a lot of those materials are found objects, objects that I share with other pianists that I saw and partly copied or used differently, things that I find in a hardware store, things that I find in my kitchen, um, and then things that I try out. Sometimes I had a sound in mind that I wanted to find or um, make heard and then I looked for um, objects that would be able to produce that sound so it's really a material study of uh, trial and error um, and I have a I have a chapter which I'll also talk about called uh, object stories in my thesis which basically um, collects stories from 16 different um, improvisers and musicians and tells their story of um, how they relate to the object or instrument or preparation, what the background is, um, and so on. And, and you, can, you can then see that there's a lot of memory, uh, emotional and um, intellectual um, capacities embedded in these objects. And I kind of feel the same way. There are some objects that I've had for maybe 20 years from the beginning that I know when I first tried them, I know when some kind of sound effect happened with them and so on. So it's, I would say it's very personal and idiosyncratic um, how these came into use, if that answers your question. Just uh, talked about memory embedded in objects. Of course, uh, memory plays an important role in improvisation as such, um, mainly as a structural tool, I would say. I talked about remembering and listening uh, being an important factor when you improvise, because you have to remember what you did to kind of go forward. So this memory, which is temporal and spatial and also physical, you know, like gestural memory, memory or body movements, that's also where uh, it's kind of at the threshold of improvisation and composition. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to investigate more with this research is also this capacity to kind of create relationships between sounds and uh, within a composition. So orchestrating is also a structuring of music, placing things in time, referencing them, and both as a listener and a performer. So I talk about timbral memory. Um, as a way to use memory strategically as a structural, reflective and performative tool, um, and also as a way to gain knowledge about improvisational processes. Um, in the different projects, uh, I use uh, memory in different ways. Sometimes memory is present in gestures and movements, and I mean like playing gestures, performing sound. And that can also be a reminder of past or future sound events. Sometimes I use movements or gestures separate from sound. We'll talk about that also. Um, sometimes I, I deal with it as memory embedded in objects and instruments, both as personal histories, but also how it's used. Um, gestural memory of holding, let's say, one of those metal bowls or fork or magnet in my hand and what I can do with that and also um, spatial sonic experiences, remembering what it sounded like in a certain performance space, maybe having a recording of that too, and then 
dealing with the recording of that and the memory that you have of it and how that interacts with each other. And one thing I found that was also revealed in, in the process of research that I found very interesting is um, intentionality. Both in the way, um, yeah, in, in many different ways, actually. Um, in, first of all, the intentionality that you bring with as a performer. You have imagination, you have um, vocabulary built up, you have creative capacities. Intentionality also means for me that you have a forward thinking. You plan to do something, even if it's just a split second. You formulate objectives. Intentionality is always situated, meaning you always respond to a certain situation, a certain instrument. In my case, the, the piano changes all the time, so you always have to kind of react to that. And the interesting thing that uh, was revealed to me during this research is also that it exists before a performance, during the performance and also after, um, manifested kind of in the shape the improvisation might have taken, uh, also as a, as a sonic experience of space or however, but it's, it lasts. And so that's an interesting, um, interesting discovery for me. Yeah, and now about uh, developing methodologies. This is um, interesting because uh, it's also something that Salome talked about uh, yesterday a little bit, if you heard her talk, um, which I found really great, how um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, first of all, we have so many different methodologies in artistic practice. And then secondly, it doesn't have to um, be completely different from our artistic practice. And um, that was something that was very important to me that I would create situations and contexts where these two things would blend, where I would have my artistic practice and the research and that they could happen simultaneously. So um, in a way I did not want to only, for example, record myself playing and then sit down and analyze it, but I wanted to perform and listen at the same time. So I made these audio papers, um, which are basically uh, consist of, past performances of interviews with other participants um, of thoughts I wrote down in a journal and I made them into a sonic piece, but I perform within it and I kind of try and make, create a context like that. And um, then I created other pieces and improvised piano um, performance situations where I also confronted myself with research questions. Um, the second thing, is creating these different listening modes, I call them, or kind of ways of giving attention. Um, listening has an agency. It acquires um, attention, giving attitude. It has ethical, social, and political implications. And these listening modes, um, depending on what you choose to listen to, whether you listen to a space or a gesture or how uh, you use an object. I call all these things listening because it's a way of attention giving. And they kind of reveal relational qualities of the sound environment. So this could be listening to past or present sound events, how it unfolds spatially, amplified versus acoustic, and so on. Mapping is another important uh, method that I used a lot in different projects. Um, mainly mapping technique and vocabulary. When I say technique and vocabulary, I really mean the materials that I use, the sounds that I use, and how I use them. And I think that's where it kind of um, applies to a lot of different artistic practices, because you always have a what and the how you use it. So for me, this mapping was a way to just observe it, to categorize it, and um, create a catalog of different sonic, gestural, and material experiences. Um, and I wrote down that these have to be idiosyncratic, multisensory, and continuously reinvented. I'll get to that later. Idiosyncratic basically because I really wanted to oppose the notion of a technique that's reproducible, that we just, you know, download a tutorial from YouTube and then everyone can play it. It's really about getting into the details and engaging and finding this kind of intimate process with whatever instrument or medium you're using. Um, Multisensory, as I said, uh, engaging with material and gesture and space and um, to get that both, 
to, to see all that as aspects of sound and of performance and continuously reinvent it simply because I'm dealing with improvisation. And so um, there has to be this flexibility. Um, the, these mapping techniques I, I use in uh, mind maps and perceptual timbre maps, I show you that on the research catalog in a second, in piano maps, which are spatial composition approaches. Um, and all these maps for me really became generative tools to create parts of a uh, performance. Yeah, as I uh, already mentioned, another me method was journaling, really writing down thoughts and reflecting on artistic processes and using that and turning that either into audio papers or these object stories that I talked about. Basically, now is the, the, the time where I go back to the research catalog and uh, if, if there's still time and just show you a few um, of the projects. I would say four, four main projects, the memory piece, the performative timbre, piano mapping, and the Christian. I'm going to start with the memory piece, rather a series of, of compositions for amplified piano and multi-channel playback. So the piano is in the middle of the room. It's amplified, and I have four to eight speakers in the corner of each, of each room. I've performed it in many different places. Um, and this playback is made out of past performances, sometimes one performance, sometimes several performances. and I kind of took these performances, recordings of it, and cut them into little pieces. So it's a sparse playback um, that I improvise with. Um, and the point of that was kind of, first of all, to confront myself with uh, different performance situations. So the recordings were made in the similar kind of setup, also in this quadraphonic setup. And I made recordings using different um, recording techniques. Sometimes I would record myself wearing um, binaural microphones in my ears. Sometimes I would ask somebody to walk around and record. Sometimes there would be a mic in the middle of the room. And of course, these microphones and the positions they're in all capture different um, experiences, sonically, timbrely. And to have that kind of information and then improvise with it that was a way for me to kind of do research and perform at the same time, to kind of see how I responded in a past situation and to have these layers of sounds and memories going on while I perform without being, you know, too, too overwhelming. There was still a lot of freedom for me to improvise. So would you say that the method of putting sounds into a map has helped you to find more sounds or more variations? Can you maybe tell something in general on how this method has been helpful? Yeah. You start asking questions and you start looking into details of sounds. And I mean, just recording what I showed you in the, in the beginning of how do I actually do this thing with that magnet? Um, what do I combine it with? Uh, what kind of myriad of variations are there to this sound and how I perform it? That has helped me immensely. And I think um, in general, when you're in a situation where you improvise, it's not random. It can be quite analytical as well. And I think if you have, in whatever way you want to categorize um, your material, but if you have done that and you know that uh, to sound A, you can respond in this and this many ways, then that just helps you because you practice transitions like that. Um, so it's, I think it doesn't matter how you, uh, approach that, but this mapping and cataloging for me was just a way of getting into more details of sounds. So yes, it, it, it has helped me, um, amazingly with that. Um, I haven't only done it with this, um, kind of videoing, but I've also done, I'm just going to share them quickly. These mind maps where I, for example, um, started um, categorizing sounds by objects which I use to produce them. So I would uh, write down fork, for example, and how many different ways I have to use the fork and then draw lines to other objects and sounds that um, are I combine them with or I could combine them with and so on. So for me, that was a very good way in, in kind of taking sounds apart 
looking for transitions, asking myself, oh, why do I never do this with that? Or uh, how come I only do this with my left hand? How come I, you know, like just getting really into your performance practice like that. And I've done that through objects. I've done that through playing methods. And I've also done um, some listening studies where I've recorded 50 sounds and compared them to each other and asking myself different questions about them. Um, that was this performative Tamba study, for example, where um, in the end I had this software tool where I would compare sound A to B in a random order and just ask myself um, how similar are these sounds in different regards in the way that they're performed um, in, in the terms of the movement and the gesture, in terms of the object that I use, in terms of the playing technique. So it's just about getting into more details and revealing processes about it. How, yeah, however you do that, for me, that was a really good way using this mapping. And this was a piece that I developed together with the choreographer. Um, and I was wondering, especially when you play the piano and it's such a big and immobile instrument and you usually are on stage stuck in the same position. Uh, and in my case, with your head inside the piano, I was uh, wondering, well, how, how do I relate to space actually when what I hear is different from what the audience members hear um, and where I'm in the same position? What what does space actually mean for me? And working with um, a choreographer, Toby Castle, um, he had the idea of multiplying the instruments. So in this picture, you also see three grand pianos that are spread out over the space. And where I worked with him to develop ways how I move between the instruments, not as a performance or a dancer or anything like that, but really as a musician, trying to find sounding transitions between the instruments. So not all of them were sounding, but most of them were. It, it basically meant that I extended my playing techniques. So when I did small gestures on one piano, I would find ways of, for example, bowing with fishing line and making that fishing line two or three meters long and bowing it from a different position in space all the way till I reached the next piano or things like that. And so it was really about finding spatial um, transitions, uh, sounding transitions, and to yeah, be in different listening positions as a performer. And the audience was basically there where you see the red cushions. So they were kind of enveloped by the sound as well. Um, and that was a very uh, interesting and important piece for me in terms of uh, opening up performance. So another way to relate to space, as I said, I'm uh, amplified with uh, microphones and placing speakers in a different um, position in space. And then um, I felt the need to also being able to move the sound from speaker to speaker. So I had a um, custom device built um, with uh, together with Sukanda Katarinata, where basically um, it allowed me to pick different microphones and move them between speakers, either with a joystick or with nine different settings um, where I would fix microphone A goes into speaker B or whatever, um, to crossfade between different settings. I called these piano maps because they were like kind of mapping out the piano in space. Um, yeah, and so that was also a way of something I called timbral choreography, where I could really be at the piano, not move myself, but have the sounds move in a kind of spatial composition if you want. And I've tried that in um, different uh, performance spaces as well. One was in Stockholm at this um, beautiful speaker dome with, I forget, yeah, 29 speakers. One was um, just with four speakers in Gothenburg. Um, yeah, I did a few different versions of that. So basically what I said in the beginning, this orchestration of timbre, trying to do it through 
finding aspects of sounds that specifically relate to space, specifically relate to my body, and then specifically deal with the objects and uh, material that I use. Yes, we have a question from Alex Wendling asks, in what ways would you like your audience to relate or respond or think about your performances? Could you talk about your intentions in the communication in your work? I can't um, really predict or I don't have the intention to to make people listen in a certain way. Mm, so that's completely open. I find that's really beautiful how, yeah, about the performance, yeah. That's really beautiful how we all have our own way of of listening and perceiving things. Um, and that differs so much uh, how everyone perceives it. So I don't have an intention to direct that um, other than through amplifying the piano um, in this certain way that I did um, was to bring the, the sounds as close as possible to the listeners. So that they could relate in a similar way, let's say, as um, I do when I have my head inside the piano. So to kind of be immersive, I guess, um, was one um, intention that I have. But other than that, how uh, everyone relates to the sounds or the compositional structure, that's, of course, left completely open. Staying within the framework of the piano helps you as opposed to custom creating new string-based instruments designed specifically for your preparations? That's a very interesting question, which I've gotten a few times. Um, I think instruments are not um, randomly exchangeable. So for Alan or Andrea to build their instruments was, you know, a, a step where they wanted to do certain things with their instrument. Me, I've learned... Um, playing on the piano and I've developed all the sounds on the piano and then they can't be separated anymore from the instrument. So it's not um, reprodu reproducible on something else. I can start and learn a different instrument and I've done so. I play the clavinet as well, but um, I haven't felt the need to, well, specifically try and get another string instrument because it works for me. And I feel that the musical ideas are developed from the grand piano. Um, and, I, and I use the keys a lot. So it's not um, that it could be a big zither or a harp or something like that. I need the keys to kind of trigger the strings and trigger the magnets and the different preparations as well. So in the end, it would be creating a string instruments with keys and then I might as well stick to the grand piano. <laughs> Mark, yeah. I am... How early in your process did you decide on this, uh, the exposition, the, the logic in your exposition layout? How, how, does it, um, does it uh, tell us how your thought process was or was it more of an after the fact thing? Um, I started pretty early on, not so much for, um, um, for a presentation, but more because it helped me to actually use it as a working space. So... I would say maybe halfway in, I started using it to just put material on it, um, videos and audio and so on, and then it developed over time. But I started pretty early. So you used it also as a work in progress, uh, as a as a tools for thinking. Oh. Absolutely, yeah. It, I think it corresponds very well with all the kind of mapping and cataloging what I like to do. So because it, you can scroll it endlessly, it was kind of perfect for that. And, yeah. and one last question uh, from me is uh, the the interface in your exposition where we can uh, press on different videos. In a way, I also experience it as one big virtual instrument. It's not just a it's not just a exposition of your. One can actually use it as a as a kind of keyboard to play several of the videos at the same time. Is that uh, also part of the message? Oh yeah, I like that part of it. Um, the mind maps that I showed you work the same way. They're not just, you can click on each little bubble. And I like the idea that uh, you can kind of stop and start sounds and um, play with them. Yeah, that's nice. I find it playful. Yeah. Or you can also say in another way that, that your map is not just a map. It's also an experience. And it's also in a way of immersing the, the spectator in this process. Yeah. So it's map and experience and process all in one. 
yeah, I like that about about that as well because yeah, it makes you participate. Exactly. exactly. Now we have one last question before the break, and it's Kuyen who asks, "What is the next step for your research? Have you considered electronic processing of the piano?" Um, it's a good question. No, I haven't considered the processing. I kind of um, started getting more in this gestural playing, so I'm I'm keen to kind of follow that a little bit. And when I say gestural, it's um, I guess it goes into a bit of a performative way um, where, yeah, and, and to use that with other, with other collaborators to see, because all my research was on solo piano um, and I would like to apply um, these things more and more to collaborative situations, um, each strand of each project. So maybe in that direction, but also digging deeper into these kind of ethical and political questions that all, all this implies because I feel like I've um, yeah I've taken that as a given or maybe not articulated that as as deeply as um, I could so that's these two strands kind of the theoretical and then trying to find more collaborative situations thank you so much Marta thank, thank you very much and uh, I wish we were in a room where we could applaud you <laughs> Uh, audibly, but uh, I know that I would have to manually unmute all the attendees, which is a five-click operation that would take hundreds and hundreds of clicks. So we no, were able. Yeah. So thank you very much. And My now, pleasure. Uh,